Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to today's panel on how to engage community, an event in the Public Humanities Hub's Public Scholarship Series. I'm Mary Chapman. I'm the Academic Director of the Hub, and I'll be moderating today's panel, which showcases three recent or current public humanities projects led by UBC humanities researchers, followed by brief presentation from, by staff from the Center for Community Engaged Learning, and then discussion. Before I introduce today's panelists, I'd like to acknowledge that although we host today's event online, the Public Humanities Hub is located on the unsurrendered traditional and ancestral territories of the Musqueam people. These lands were sites of learning for many generations before UBC stood here, and we recognize our obligations as scholars and learners to ensure that the work we do both in person and virtually upholds the best of that longstanding learning context. We invite you to acknowledge in the chat the lands that you do your work on. We have five speakers today. The first four will reflect on the challenges of building relationships with community partners, doing community engaged work with or without funding, incorporating community based projects into one's pedagogy or research goals, and accessing UBC resources for community engaged work. So we'll start with Ben Bryce and Noah James, who will speak about their collaboration with the Rody House Museum. Ben is a faculty member in history and a current public humanities faculty scholar. His research focuses on migration in the Americas. He's chair of the Latin American Studies Program at UBC, and he's also editor-in-chief of the Journal of the Canadian Historical Association. He's currently working on a virtual exhibit in collaboration with the Argentine National Museum of Immigration in Buenos Aires. Noah James is beginning an MA in history at UBC and hopes to write a thesis related to the career of Alvo von Alvensleben, a prominent pre-World War I German capitalist in BC. Our second speaker is Maria Carbonetti, a lecturer in the Department of French, Hispanic, and Italian Studies, and a recipient of a recent Public Humanities Hub Public Engagement Award. Maria will speak about how she involves her students in a project called Spanish for Community, which is a hub for community engagement and service learning at FHIS, which she directs. She directs Spanish for Community, not FHIS. Spanish for Community offers students the opportunity to apply their linguistic skills and to learn from local partners working with the Hispanic community here in Metro Vancouver and beyond. Next will be Sydney Lines, who will speak about a partnership between Heritage Vancouver Society, Museum of Vancouver, and the Public Humanities Hub. Sydney is a PhD candidate in English, a UBC public scholar, and project manager strategic initiatives at the Public Humanities Hub. She is currently collaborating on a Heritage BC funded project called Kuwentong Pama Mahe, Stories and Storytelling of Home and Identity from Filipino Canadian Perspectives. This is a project in partnership with Heritage Vancouver Society, Sliced Mango Collective, UBC Asian Canadian Migration Studies. She's also co-leading a new event series with Heritage Vancouver Society, the Museum of Vancouver and the Hub called Making Space, which draws inspiration from current Museum of Vancouver exhibits to facilitate topical discussions about heritage and culture. So these researchers' uh, presentations will be followed by a presentation by Kyle Nelson, a community engaged learning officer at UBC's Center for Community Engaged Learning on Cecil resources and funding for these kinds of community uh, partnerships. And I'll also, I'll follow Kyle's presentation to talk a little bit about the funding that the hub makes available for community projects that aren't 
course based, and then we'll open it for discussion. So I want to invite Noah and Ben to start us off. Okay, um, I will start. I'm going to share a screen, although probably not for all that much good, but I hope you can see it. I think I saw Mary give a thumbs up. Uh, and I, I think I'm already short on time um, because of uh, uh, our plans for today. And so I'll begin by just rambling a little bit and wasting even more of my time by accident. Um, I was recently interviewed about experiential learning, and I came to this realization that some people's definition of experiential learning is different than my own. And in particular, my experience with experiential learning has always been sort of to go all in. And so the, the course I, I'll talk about it briefly today was uh, like entirely unorthodox in every aspect and nothing about it was sort of a normal history class. Uh, whereas then in the interview when they were trying to do some collect data about experiential learning at UBC, uh, it became clear that, you know, I guess you could send students to a museum in the free time and then talk about it in class the next week. And that's still on a spectrum of experience uh, alongside learning, right? Uh, and so my presentation today, I'm, I think I'm officially uh, talking about community engaged learning, but for me, community engaged learning and experiential learning have been sort of interchangeable concepts. Um, so uh, with, but I maybe frame with that brief opening about experiential learning and how basically I see that as synonymous as, as with community engaged learning, uh, that my definitions here, and maybe part of the point of today, that my definition here uh, might not be the same of what you expected, and maybe that would be some food for thought for our conversation. So um, I have a five point outline, and I'm not going to, I'm going to just stop talking after about uh, 12 minutes max. Um, but the key thing here is that I taught, uh, I've taught three experiential learning seminars, I repeated one, and then uh, I did another one. So the first one I did was at a different job uh, in Northern British Columbia, and then the course was off-site entirely in Prince Rupert at a National Historic Site. Uh, and then this past year, uh, and with the support of the Center for Community Engaged Learning at UBC, I did a sort of a, a, a simpler version of that, uh, and in part engaging with the local museum in the West End, the Rody House Museum, and then Noah will speak also about sort of how that project carried on not just in the seminar, but then into a summer the summer work as well for two students, Noah and another one, Shane Atienza. Um, I'll tell, talk about some of the goals, and this is the goals were experiential learning and therefore community engagement in terms of thinking of getting history students to do things um, in dialogue with, with a museum, uh, and then sort of reflect on that for history students of the narratives that we tell or that, you know, that we tell in our books that sell 300 copies and that are told in, in heritage sector museums that uh, you know have much larger visitorships and but that have sort of a different understanding of what history is or what narratives are uh, and I will uh, get to this question of, of money and funding although that will be a focus for today's uh, event so basically I, I hijacked the very last minute last November just as the pandemic was ending I finished my syllabus on about November 10th uh, and I was going to go all in on getting off campus and going to uh, archives and into a museum. And then, of course, um, two weeks later, it started to look worse and worse of an idea as, as Omicron set in. Uh, but basically what I did is I took a course that in old, in former times, I would have every week in a fourth year seminar, students would read about half a book and we would just discuss half a book and it would just be sort of a, a mini graduate class at the fourth year level. We just talk about books and that would be the end of it. Um, instead, what I did is we still read the same five books. So at the core, there was the same rigor as any other history seminar, except we discussed them only in five weeks. So the books were spread out during the semester. And then in all the free time that we weren't spending discussing the book in smaller parts, we did a whole bunch of sort of public facing things, which included a liaising with the Rody House Museum in the West End. So part of it, I had a, a series of guest speakers, including Sydney Lyons, come to the class and we spoke about various ways to, to present research um, even at the undergraduate level in sort of more public facing ways. So there's a workshop on podcasting, workshop on museum, two workshops on museum, museum exhibits, a workshop on Wikipedia and on, on making blogs and just thinking about turning uh, conventional research into something more public facing. Uh, the assignments then were, were making these public facing deliverables. So students didn't write a conventional history essay. They, they did conventional research in archives or actually even sort of above average research in archives, but then uh, their, their assignments were doing things like writing an 800 word page, uh, 800 word uh, blog or uh, making a podcast and things like that. And then part of that was engaging specifically with the museum and the hopes that some of the assignments through independent research would, would provide content that could either complement the museum, whether the museum wanted to use it or not, um, but sort of at least put it out there as something that's sort of adding to the narrative of, in this case, this uh, 1890s Victorian home in the West End. 
Uh, in contrast, and more a more extreme example of experiential learning and, and community engagement is students from Prince George in the middle of British Columbia traveled to the Pacific coast of British Columbia from, to Prince Rupert. Uh, and we stayed on site. We slept at this National Historic Site. They had this bunkhouse. Uh, we did the readings ahead of time. We discussed them over in seminars. We invited uh, various community members, uh, including two Indigenous elders, uh, to come and sort of talk about history, sort of engage with history in all sorts of ways. Um, and this was a, a more all-in kind of experiential learning class, which was fundamentally about community engagement. We got interviewed by CBC Prince Rupert. We gave a talk to the public library. Um, we were engaging with all these uh, various community partners. Um, and again, we had this goal of taking assignments, trying to take students' archival research and sort of add content to this National Historic Site through our own independent website in the hopes that the community partner would um, it, uh, appreciate some of the content we were producing. And so thinking maybe sort of these like interrelated things of experiential learning, communication learning, um, one of the ideas of the way I've taught these history courses is thinking about taking history skills of just conventional, you read some books, you write a, a review, or you go to an archive, or you read some primary documents, you write an essay, but instead to think of them as sort of lines on their CD. So even though I only did two sort of public humanity or sort of digital humanities projects, like write, write a museum, like write a blog or make a podcast, um, as sort of an outcome from their degree, if they're doing this in a fourth year class, uh, to say, I, what kind of skills did you learn in history? Of course, other than just research skills and writing skills and analytical skills, they could say things like, oh, I, you know, I, 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 I engaged with a museum or I, I uh, worked on a website to get collaboratively and put research in the public sphere or I made a podcast. So some, some, some sort of extra things that students could take away from their time at UBC or, or UNBC in the, in the case of the former course. Uh, and sort of thinking about how experiential learning or community engagement could be helpful things to prepare students for their lives after university. And so I, I, in the new version I'm going to be doing this this year more, more right, as a carry on in, in January, um, there's this ongoing push at UBC to um, think about uh, applied skills and sort of life after, after university. It was part of our previous strategic initiative, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and um, so th sort of some of these ideas are sort of shaping the assignments and the and uh, and the way the reasons for community engagement, because it can sort of helps students think about uh, uh, the skills that they learn, getting some hands on experience during their degrees, as sort of translatable skills, very much uh, related to their degrees. So not getting a history degree and getting a job for the Ministry of Environment or, or, or Education or something like that, but something that's uh, at least part of a history degree could lead into uh, future jobs in the heritage sector or or future education, which could still link back to the heritage sector. So one of the reasons uh, for community engagement, or it's a, also maybe a, reflect, a learning experience for history students, if you think in, the, in particular in the case of history, that history, unlike probably any other degree at UBC, we have our own television channel. It's called the History Channel. Uh, and we're sort of competing, though, with um, this other ways that history is being told in ways that maybe um, not every discipline has that same kind of relationship. So, of course, history is being made not just by me, but also by the History Channel or by documentaries, which are, you know, sort of semi-accurate um, popular culture, whether it's movies and songs or novels or memory, which, of course, something we study as historians, but people's memories are, are defining narratives as much as my my lectures are, right? And this became something actually very obvious in um our community engaged learning that we're engaging with another kind of historical institution that's different from the books and the professors of, of the university. And I think it was an, a helpful learning experience to reflect on these sort of competing ways that history is being told. And so in the case of the cannery course might have been more extreme. You know, we read all this, these critical analyses of how fisheries policies were fundamental and the systematic dispossession of indigenous peoples from land and resources. And then we show up at a cannery and, and the whole narrative is about sort of the the glorious rise of an industry and an expansionist uh, sort of industrial economy in Northern British Columbia. So the things that they were taught, how they talked about fisheries kind of had nothing to do with the historiography on fisheries uh, in a turn of the, uh, in turn of the 20th century Canada. And so I think that's sort of an important learning exercise and the community engagement in this case for, for historians um, can help students reflect on how they can translate their degrees into the real world or how the real world is coexisting with the university. And therefore by bridging gaps, we're also sort of uh, bridging ways of, of talking about history. 
So as a simple delivery and so no actual buy-in from the institutions, but it was sort of laid out there as a, the point of departure that the course didn't use a Canvas page. It had an open access website and then students' assignments as they did them uh, with student agreement, they were posted to the website. So there's sort of a, a takeaway from, from the courses. The second image here is from the UBC course with the Rody House. Um, and the first one is from the Cannery. So student research projects got posted online. So if nothing else, they had this. It's still on there. Their, their research is sort of permanently on the web, uh, you know, with their consent, uh, and with the hope that the, the these heritage sector institutions would maybe be interested in um, linking to them or tweeting them as a way to sort of show how we're ex expanding some of the narratives that were found at the institutions. None of our narratives were in contradiction, but they were definitely talking about different things. So just quickly to conclude, uh, I'm coming close. I'm at 10 minutes already. Um, so uh, to reflect on other people thinking about community engaged uh, learning. So one, uh, a history professor writes to a history museum. They seem to overwhelmingly very interested in, in developing a relationship. I, or they, my two tries, it has been just open. They opened the doors, rolled out the red carpet for some sort of engagement with us. Uh, and uh, I'm very open to collaboration. Uh, they did things like gave us special rates, whether it's to visit the Rody House Museum or to come to our class in the case of the Rody House or to actually go stay on site in case of the, the Cannery and Prince Rupert. Uh, in both cases, these courses benefited from financial support from the institution. So most recently from the UBC um, um, Center for Community Engaged Learning, a grant that kind of covered all of our expenses, not only in terms of, you know, visiting speakers or visiting the cost of visiting the museum, but also the money has been used to um, help make the student deliverables more, more permanent. So one student, his final research project was uh, 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 immigrant recipe books in British Columbia, and he compiled them, and then we published 25 issues, and they're actually on sale at, at the Rody House uh, uh, gift shop, so things like that. So the money was being used to help the deliver the public deliverables of, of student research. Uh, and especially if it, in this local case, the money was definitely helpful for the, the, the deliverables, but in terms of delivery of the course, you know, students could have paid for their own museum exhibit, um, Th uh, visiting the museum and things like that, but it made it a bit more accessible. But in, in other courses, if it was further afield, like traveling to another city, uh, the university support and paying student travel was some, a really important priority. So it wouldn't deter any enrollment and it would sort of be more accessible for all students and not just ones who could uh, afford to pay for it. Now, and just to conclude, some of the more critical thoughts uh, I've been having about experiential learning and therefore community engaged learning is about who should be doing it. And, and so I'm a, I'm a research team position. Uh, and therefore, if this is a conversation about teaching this, I feel this is an interesting thing to reflect on here. But in terms of so from in my case, anyway, uh, creating these courses uh, required a fair amount of work, a fair amount of planning. And so I'm sort of in a, in a privileged position to be able to dedicate the time to that um, kind of um, community engaged learning. So with a lower teaching workload, I can also actually spend more time in developing these courses. And so I think this should, this should be a call to um, sort of the research stream professors at the university think about this kind of community engagement with their teaching. Um, uh, it's a, a load that we can bear. Um, and um, I think it adds a lot to our, our teaching as well. Um, in uh, doing other things like applying for grants takes extra time. To, uh, and not only uh, applying for, uh, so again, as a, so the most privileged part of the teaching part of the UBC is the research stream professors. Uh, we can also line up our courses the way we want. We can uh, we can teach on certain days. We can teach block seminars. There's all sorts of things that a, a permanent faculty member in particular and with a lighter teaching though can really use to set up courses that might take a year to plan than uh, apply for grants. And so it's something that I think it was worth reflecting on um, in terms of, uh, and in reverse, if those aren't the situations that exist for, and you want, if a department wants to be engaged in learning, um, trying to put the burden of that work on other people um, is also unfair. Uh, and there's other, so just to kind of reflecting on this sort of planning part and, and, the, and the time part uh, required. Um, uh, and then this question of accessibility, and I'll conclude on this, that the cost, if you're, if an experiential learning course, which has got community engagement involved in it, um, requires any sort of travel or has any, even if it's just uh, museum entry fee, uh, costs and things like that, um, it, there's a question of accessibility. So then the question of university funding to support that, um, I think is important. Um, and especially though, if you're, uh, if it involves traveling to another site, if there's, you know, $500 of travel costs or $3,000 of travel costs, um, that this, if we're just doubling down on experiential learning or community engagement, there should be, uh, keeping that in mind, whether we should have local versions, uh, local options alongside internationalization at UBC, um, and, um, university support for those that, 
when it is not just a local course. And so I'll conclude there and uh, thank you for your attention. Look forward to the conversation going forward. Thanks very much. No, I think we're going to hear hey, from Noah. Noah. Yep. Was in the class. All right. Just let me uh, bring up my slides. Um. All right. Yes. So um, my name is Noah James. And in the winter term of 2022, I was still an undergraduate student or a, an unclassified student at UBC. And I took uh, Dr. Bryce's um, seminar, Migration in the Americas, History 403C. Um, I really did enjoy the course. Uh, it was quite um, it's sort of different from previous history courses I've taken with uh, um, hands-on research, uh, visits to museums, uh, lots of visits by um, uh, different experts in the fields related to um, libraries, curation, and things of that kind. Um, um, so, uh, one of my assignments, um, I responded to a book called um, Food and Italians in North and South America by Elizabeth Zanoni. And I ended up writing a short piece on A.G. Ferreira, who is the first Italian consul in Vancouver and ran a fine French slash Italian restaurant. Um, uh, that ended up being posted on the course website Ben mentioned. Um, and I was also one of the only students um, who chose to do a final project that was in some way connected to the Rody House Museum, which was one of the course's partners. Um, I ended up writing a research paper entitled Francis Rattenbury and the Rody's House. They explored the claim that the famous architect Francis Rattenbury, who also designed the Victoria Parliament buildings and other prominent buildings like the Empress Hotel and what is now the Vancouver Art Gallery, designed a house for the Rody family in Vancouver's West End in 1892. Um, I think my essay was quite successful. I ended up by combining different sources of information, being able to demonstrate that claim quite well. Um, however, that wasn't the end of my um, relationship with the Rody House. Um, in the late spring, it was announced that there was a summer job opening at the Rody House Museum connected to the history department at UBC. And I thought it would be an interesting experience to work for a museum over the summer, so I applied for the job. I actually didn't end up getting the jo job that was posted, which included more public facing duties like operating guided tours. Um, that job was given to Shane Natienza, the other student Ben mentioned. However, um, the museum manager, Sarah Heffer and the museum president, Billy Ann Wu, were interested in some of the research ideas that I put forward during my interview. So a second job, which would focus on research was created specifically for me. Um, so in that position, I quickly discovered that the Germanness of the Rodi family, the Rude family, was underemphasized at the museum, and as well as the fact that there had been very little scholarly research of any kind into the German community in Vancouver in the late 19th century. So uh, I set out to find out as much about the German community in Vancouver in that year as I could. Uh, by visiting the Vancouver archives several times and diving deep into the online online newspaper archives I had access to. Um, so as part of that position, I ended up writing two short articles or blogs for the museum. The first was entitled Breweries and Brewmasters, the German influence on beer in early Vancouver, which explored the early brewing industry in Vancouver. Um, and brewing was a very significant industry for the young city and it was dominated by German brewers and brewmasters. And as a German cult uh, cultural staple, um, the most loyal customers of early breweries were members of the small German community in the city. Um, I've just included a couple of photos. This is um, um, some employees of Doring and Marstrand Brewery that operated uh, in Vancouver during that time. Um, Volzein is uh, printed underneath, sort of a, a, a sort of I guess you could translate that as good health, a, a cheer. Um, 
Here's another brewery, which is operated by another German called jo Joseph Kapler on the east side of the city. Um, and uh, a bit later on towards the towards 1900, um, there is a conglomeration of two of the larger breweries, the Doring and Marstrand Brewery and the Red Cross Brewery, which was uh, which had um, another German, Henry Traeger, as its uh, brewmaster. Um, this was sort of the largest brewery at the turn of the century in the region. Um, another article I wrote was about the Vancouver Leader Kranz, a largely forgotten organization in early Vancouver that was simultaneously a German men's choir, a musical society, and a nationalistic German organization in Vancouver. Gustav Rude was a prominent member of the society, um, and it was fun to be able to link an artifact in the museum, Gustav Rude's exquisitely bound bass choir part, to a choir that had been completely forgotten. Um, just got a picture of that here. Um, and these two topics actually have quite a lot of connections. Most of the prominent German brewmasters and brew, uh, breweries in Vancouver were also members of the Vancouver Liederkranz. Uh, and beer was seemingly always present at musical entertainments and celebrations that the Vancouver Liederkranz organized. Um, my last involvement with the Rody House Museum was in just the last month when I put together an ex exhibit that manifests in visual format my project on Francis Rattenbury and the Rody's House. Um, so that's currently on display in the museum and will be displayed until early December, I believe. Um, and to sort of to summarize, um, so my work with the Rody House Museum has largely consisted of doing research and then putting that research out there for the museum and its staff, and then hopefully the public to engage with. Um, long term after, especially after this exhibit is taken down, um, a successful engagement with the public vis-a-vis -vis my research on the German community largely depends on whether the museum itself wants to adjust the narrative it conveys from its current showcasing of a typical middle-class household in uh, Vancouver in the late uh, Victorian era of the 1890s to perhaps one emphasizing the unique ethnic and cultural characteristics of the Rodis as a family of German immigrants. Um, that's kind of what I've been trying to encourage the, the museum to engage with the idea of perhaps adjusting its narrative in some small ways. Um, I've just got a few photos of the exhibit that's currently up. And this was kind of a fun way to sort of uh, do a first exhibit. I'm not sure if I ever want to end up working in museums in some way in the future, but it's sort of a fun way to get a taste of <laughs> a taste of it. Um, the things things I would do differently a second time. So it's really, in some ways, a learning experience, um, which I can use in the future. Um, but yes, that's the end of my presentation. I'll hand it over to who's next. Um, I'm very happy to to be here among friends. I have been working with um, with Kyle forever, and um, with Ben also. Uh, I have uh, quite a bit of uh, common interests, I think. <laughs> So, um, well, I will present about uh, Spanish for Community, and uh, this is a little bit different than, um, it's not a project, um, it's an initiative uh, at the French, Hispanic, and Italian department um, that houses several projects um, at the same time. Uh, it's an experiential and community-engaged learning initiative um, for Spanish language learner heritage and also native speakers. Um, we coordinate and run uh, different uh, linguistic and cultural community-based projects providing relevant learning opportunities for students and also facilitating cultural uh, open events for the community. Um, we don't have a specific budget uh, assigned to us. Uh, we have been supported for the Center for Community Engaged Learning mostly. Um, and also um, with collaborations um, 
little fundings from Latin American studies. And uh, this is a topic about the funding that is very important. I, I, I appreciate uh, the Ben Ben slide about, about it because we share part of this, um, this uh, interest. Okay, well, uh, for uh, Spanish for Community, um, all the projects are around different themes, mainly related to ju social justice, human and earth rights, the diversity, inclusivity, public health, and curriculum decolonization and indigenization. Uh, for example, the image that you see here, uh, it was a booklet that we translated for um, uh, refugee seekers in Spanish for the, um, for the hearing. Um, which is a very complex process, and um, this uh, this booklet was sponsored by the UN. Um, Spanish for Community has a self enrolled course for students and for project coordination, and uh, and we have um, there are models on training, language based community learning resources. We also have um, modules on each one of the projects with, that are running uh, with documents, instructions, etc. And st instructors and students co-create and contribute to the course content. And uh, all the uh, our work are mostly with um, high intermediate Spanish learners um, from third year and fourth year for also advanced learners. Uh, and uh, Spanish for Community also have a house, which will be uh, our blog, where students are partners uh, contribute, um, talking about the experience, showcasing the projects, etc. cetera. Um, Spanish for Community started in 2011. And so far we have a little bit more than 800 students that had participated in all these years. And uh, we engage with uh, different, we have different type of projects and um, we have partnered with neighborhood houses, with senior centers, with in the area of health, with uh, multicultural family clinics and the BC Women's Hospital, uh, Paddlers Abreast Canada, which is an organization that uh, offers the training and, uh, and dragon boat for women that have experienced um, breast cancer survivors, they are breast cancer survivors. And also with organizations working with immigrants from Mosaic to Kimbrace and to Vancouver Association for a Torture Survivors. And we also have uh, a branch of global engagement in Central and South America, but we don't go uh, abroad. We do it from our classes. And we have been involved with uh, the Indigenous Weavers Cooperative through Moscow in Peru, um, in Colombia, uh, with community libraries uh, through Fundación Ratón de Biblioteca and, and more. We, we have been partnering with, with, um, with uh, several um, organizations in, uh, um, in South America and in Central America. And uh, we are featured on the UBC Strategic Plan website as an example of global network and uh, uh, practical learning. Okay, we have different, as I said, different type of projects. So this is why it is difficult for, uh, for us to, uh, it's a little bit different as an initiative because we are not one project, we, we are a half. And uh, for that reason also, uh, funding and all the logistics related to workload and who is doing what and uh, it is more difficult for, for the unit. Um, we are really kind of uh, outside of the box um, creature, let's say. So we have a course-based projects for high, high intermediate and advanced students that are, um, that are um, around one particular course, could be a third year or fourth year uh, language courses. We have also cross-course project, which means is that in one project, there are different courses that uh, take care of certain parts of, 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 the, of the project um, according to their language level. So there are students from different years working together. 
Um, and then we have co-curricular experiential and service learning that is volunteer based. In this kind of uh, projects, we open uh, the possibility to students that are not enrolled on a specific course, but are from our department or are even from outside the department, uh, but they are um, they ha they have a high higher le uh, level of, of language to work on specific uh, service learning projects, particularly with translation. Not only with translation, but most most of the time is with translation. We have a translation team um, that work on very on specific uh, projects that are, as I said, not related to a course. And finally, uh, we create extra and co-curricular community events that are open to the community and are related to, uh, to those themes I mentioned before, and sometimes uh, are also related to course-based or cross-course-based projects. Okay, for example, um, here you have uh, uh, some samples. In this case, um, um, the students were working with Raton de Biblioteca um, in Colombia and uh, given uh, the ch children cl English classes, virtual English classes, as you can see there. And uh, yeah, and 47 students participating in this. Um, we created a database for um, on community libraries for uh, um, the organization, and um, that was a mandatory um, uh, component for a 302 course, Spanish 302, and also um, um, the students were allowed to participate and on these uh, classes, these English classes, uh, interacting directly with the children. Raton de Biblioteca um, provided um, uh, co-teaching uh, for our students, and it was four hours of presentations. They did. They uh, came to our class virtually, and uh, on different topics, and engaged the students in discussions. Okay, let's go here. But the project I'm I will talk more is uh, Palabras Madre, Mother Words, and it was a translation project. And um, the students in, in third year um, worked uh, on translating um, poetry from uh, Mapuche authors uh, in Chile. Mapuche is for the ones that maybe I'm not sure you know, is the largest indigenous um, uh, group in South America um, and in the, in the South Cone in Chile and in Argentina. And they translate in poetry um, uh, from Spanish to English and also uh, uh, poems that were uh, created originally in Mapuzungun, which is the indigenous language and then translated into Spanish um, by the, the poets and the students translated into English. And this was in partnership with the University of La Frontera, the Universidad de la Frontera. And um, it was the idea was bridging people and land through language. Hmm? Okay, and we did it with um, the Instituto de Estudios Indígenas de la Facultad de Humanidades de la Universidad de la, de la Frontera, and with Dr. Carolina Navarrete, that was the coordinator there, and the co-teaching. Um, uh, part was by Jacqueline Caniwan, that is a professor and researcher in linguistic in Mapuzungun and Spanish. She is a poet, um, a Mapuche poet and activist that worked with the students um, for the translations. So, thank you. And the idea was the creation of a trilingual blog featuring the selection of poems um, a glossary of important cultural notions for the Mapuche people from Mapuzungun to Spanish and English and the author's bio and images related to nature and land, identity and belonging curated by the students. And the, as I said, the participants were uh, 30 students from Spanish um, 
301 class. And why uh, this partnership, partnership with UFRO? We started conversations about um, with, um, with Jacqueline Caniguan and other scholars there about the, co the colonial continuities um, and the territories and languages that both institutions, um, the Universidad de la Frontera and UBC, we share. We are uh, both in the West Coast. We are in unceded, uh, located in unceded terri indigenous territories. We are teaching in colonial languages, and um, we both are engaged in uh, decolonizing the curriculum. So this is how we we started this partnership uh, with this with these conversations, and we wanted the students. Um, this, our students particularly to um, to relate to indigenous communities in South America um, uh, through literature and to make connections with our our reality uh, here in in the Vancouver campus. Um, so why translating Mapuche authors in a Spanish language class then? Uh, first, to reflect on the political status and the vitality of indigenous languages in Latin America, and specifically in Chile. Second, uh, to apply communicative skills by interacting with the Hispanic community, with the Chilean Mapuche scholar and poet Jacqueline Caniguan, as well as other members for our partner institutions that came uh, uh, and have discussions with the students. And then to read and to interpret Chilean poetry by authors from the Mapuche community in the Araucanía uh, and to reflect about the dynamic between both languages in contact, Spanish and, and Mapuzungun, um, through poetry. And this, and I think is the most important thing, is to reflect and compare indigenous experiences in both territories where UBC and our partner institution uh, are situated, the continuity of colonialism and the place of indigenous languages and colonial languages in cultural production. I will, um, I will show you uh, the, the blog, but they, uh, there was a process of translation, but also um, uh, the students um, uh, selected images linking the poetry that they translated with students' geographic and cultural uh, relevant, re uh, relevant spaces from Canada. So I will show you because it's um, um, uh, something that I would like you to see. So the students created the blog with all the poems and here it is. Here. The blog consisted in uh, the trilingual um, text in Mapuzungun, in Spanish, and then the student translations in English. They uh, selected pictures based on um, a line that, that spoke to them. In this case, the great river of the sky sleeps and awaits me from one of the poems. And this student um, presented an image in Portoco, BC, um, and reflected on the relationship that she found uh, between the line in the in the Spanish in the Mapuche poem and this uh, particular uh, space in BC and the relationship with the, um, the indigenous uh, territory. Here you have the the Mapuzungun um, poem, the Spanish poem, and the translation that the student offered. And she included another picture reflecting also, I don't know if you can really see, um, reflecting uh, on, on the, 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 the territory here, right? Yeah. And she says, I chose this image because the clouds and the bright color of the skies remind me of the rapids of the river and if the whole earth is submerged underneath. It was her reflection of the Kwahul Cha, that is the name of this geographic uh, site uh, in the Slewatu uh, territory. So this is the bridge that we wanted to create. Okay, so let me 
Yes, and coming back to the presentation. Um, there you go. There. Okay. So the students then um, created this uh, um, gallery of images. And um, we finish uh, with a, a community event. There was a reading in dialogue um, from Jacqueline Kenny Wang, the Mapuche author. She read in Mapusungun. Um, you, uh, members of the of the of our, of our partner institution uh, read in Spanish the poems, and the students offered their translation vis a vis. So it was a kind of a dialogue that we that we made. And uh, one of the most important points in this um, in this final event was the presence of a uh, presence of um, of a Maskem. Uh, member and we had the joy and the honor of have Debra Sparrow, artist and knowledge keeper, um, giving us her teaching and and talking to the students and to to the community. So this was the final community event, and this event was an open event. So uh, we had um, a, a very good turnout and and. Um, in, in this way, we finish this bridge of words and image. So uh, I don't want to go over the time. Um, and I think with this, we'll, I will finish um, my presentation. So Spanish for Community is, 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 is not a project. It's, it's a half. What, it's like a tapestry of projects and we can uh, this way we can offer um the student this the students uh, an, an enriched experience and and the way a way to apply what what they are learning um not only language wise but also culture wise and um we are very grateful for the support of the community engaged uh, learning office and and Kyle that have been our guard angel i think <laughs> since the very beginning so thank you. Thank you, Maria. Now, Sydney. I will stop sharing. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, I'm going to put a link to my slides in the chat here if people would like to follow along. There should be a PDF there that people can see. Um, so I'll just start by saying um, I'm happy to be sharing space today with so many other community engaged folks at UBC. It's exciting. And thanks also to our audience for being here today. Um, my name is Sydney Lyons. I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of English here at UBC, and I'm also working full time at the moment on a co-op term as project manager with the Public Humanities Hub. Um, the way I'm going to approach the presentation today, it will have two parts, and I'm trying to be—I'll try to be quick about it. Um, the first is going to focus on sort of my own approach to community-engaged work, and then I'll move us into part two, which is the kind of where I'll talk about some projects. Um, so with that, I will share my screen here. Okay, can I get a thumbs up that people can see it? Everybody can see it? Okay, cool. All right. Um, and the slides are in the chat, right? Okay, so since we're talking about community engagement and public scholarship in the public humanities, um, like Ben, I want to lay out some definitions here of how these teams, terms are working and how they work in my mind, because I think sometimes people use these interchangeably, but they're they're different. Um, let's see here. So this is how I think about them. Um, public scholarship is basically scholarly work that researchers do in public, with the public, for the public, or with some kind of public impact. Public humanities are the humanities-centered form of that work. And then community engagement is, at a very basic level, the collaboration, partnership, and reciprocity between scholars and a wider community. So um, when I use those terms today, that's how I'm thinking about them. Uh, go to our next slide. Um, community engagement for me anyway, um, if you think about it, it's so community engagement can be a type of public scholarship, but not all public scholarship is community engaged. And I'm now looking at how when I turn this into a PDF, it messed up my text. It's going to annoy me. That's OK. Um, but for me personally, the most fulfilling and rewarding is when community engaged public humanities work sits right in that center. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So these three things kind of come together. So my working philosophy is that community engaged work is actually care work. 
It's fundamentally about relationships, reciprocity, responsibility, and reflection. And those four things have to be there. Those are key. So let's start by um, talking a bit about relationships. There's no possibility of forming connections with communities without relationship building activities. And that requires time and commitment, compromise and trust. And that's part of what makes some of the community engaged work so difficult to do is that it takes all of that. Um, and when we think about institutions and the university in particular, um, the university has a long history of being extractive and harmful with communities, particularly where communities are marginalized. So as academics, we need to acknowledge that historical baggage that we carry into that community and into those relationships um, and understand that sometimes that will make it harder and it will make it take longer to gain a community's trust. So you have to meet your community where they are and then you have to work from there. So reciprocity. Make sure that your work is reciprocal and co-creative. If you cannot articulate clear benefits that the work generates for the community you're working with, that doesn't sound like community engaged work. So if your project is more of a sage on the stage model where the scholar comes and speaks in public about their research, that's not a co-creative model. So it's not necessarily community engaged. Um, they should be also um, being able to reflect and offer expertise on uh, whatever your project is. So as scholars, we need to enter the relationship with the mindset of I'm not the expert, I'm one of many experts here. Um, people will bring a wealth of lived experience, of professional experience, of cultural experience, et cetera, um, that will be different from yours, from yours, and that will inform the work um, in ways that are better. So in a reciprocal project, you'll weave just some of the threads in that collective web of expertise. Responsibility. Uh, so this one I'll spend a little bit more time on. Community engaged work needs to be done responsibly, which means the work um, and the relationship and the work produced need to be ethical and equitable. I have a kind of a long block quote here. So the Modern Language Association recently published a set of guidelines for evaluating publicly engaged humanities scholarship. And I've linked that here in the slides as well, if you'd like to take a look at it. It's like a, I think a 10 to 12 page report. So the, the quote here, the MLA guidelines state that an ethical approach to the public humanities begins with the open acknowledgement that the work takes place despite whatever economic and policy initiatives are currently in play and should be approached from the standpoint of shared struggle and common cause. Such an approach proceeds from the assumption that public humanities scholarship often challenges the power of institutions and should be valued for the challenges it presents. Public humanities scholarship insists that communities are sites of knowledge and cultural production, as well as spaces whose meanings derive from the lived experience of the inhabitants as they engage in acts of placemaking. So as such, this work should help create healthier and more generative relationships with communities, not mimic the extractive posture of institutions whose values have perpetuated um, systemic racism and colonialist, uh, colonialist ideologies, or in some cases continue to. Um, and then part of that also means that as researchers, we have to examine and attend to our own positionalities and privileges that we carry into that community work. So you might ask yourself, you know, what are the particular risks involved in working with your defined community? How are you helping to mitigate any potential harm that you may uh, that may come to them as a result of that work? You have to understand who your community is and what their needs are. You need to work with the timelines and constraints that they have because they will have them. Um, the university and community organizations run on different timelines and in different schedules. Uh, that's a reality and that requires flexibility. So some of your care work may then entail actively trying to work through and around some of the structural or systemic barriers that the community faces in doing the work with you. Um, so that means you also need to define your theory of change. Your community engaged work should not come from what Eve Tuck calls a damage centered framework or the idea that these communities are somehow inherently deficient, um, lacking, and or broken. Um, instead, we should be using what she calls a desire-based framework, which starts from a place of, um, quote, understanding complexity, contradiction, and the self-determination of lived lives. A desire-based framework, quote, documents not only the painful elements of social realities, but also the wisdom and the hope, end quote. So Tuck talks quite about this in a 2009 article that's excellent and I recommend people read that's called Suspending Damage, an Open Letter to Communities. And I've linked that here in the slides as well. Um, well, let's talk about reflection. Community-engaged work requires reflective practices throughout and after the work. So you should be regularly checking in with your community to make sure that things are still going as planned, that no issues have developed, that if changes are needed, everyone consents to shifting those goalposts and how those goalposts are shifted. 
Um, this is also part of the relationship building activity that helps to build and maintain trust. So community engagement is iterative, it's ongoing, and reflection affords the kind of learning and meaning making required to maintain the relationships you already have while potentially improving upon your community engagement methods in the future. There may also be points of failure. A project may change in some way from what was originally imagined, but failure also creates opportunities for learning and growth. Reflection allows you to evaluate your own methods and approaches and to re-examine your own theory of change. It's important to build reflective activities into your community engagement process. So let's talk a bit about some of the projects. So the first partnership I wanna talk about is actually two separate projects around the Joyce Collingwood neighborhood. Um, but they kind of sort of evolved out of each other. So in the summer of 2021, um, Heritage Vancouver Society had decided to host what they called reading rooms. And these were small discussion oriented Zoom gatherings focused on topics that reevaluated ideas of heritage by using case studies that illustrated uh, lived social realities that intersected with larger questions about things that were um, more in tune with lived inequities and diversity and social justice. So traditionally, heritage groups have been largely focused on built heritage, um, which is more specifically a colonial built heritage. Uh, and the reading room became a space to experiment with how heritage could be reimagined to contribute more meaningfully towards a broader social benefit. So for reading room, readings could mean podcasts, it could mean news articles, it could mean uh, short videos about a topic that were circulated to registered participants, and then everyone sort of shows up to participate in the moderated discussion, which is first framed around those readings, and then they would be ushered into breakout groups that were moderated uh, with a facilitator who asked more guiding questions. And then after the first few reading rooms, HBS, um, because they were successful, reached out to look for volunteer facilitators to create a new kind of event that we came to call the listening room, um, where community knowledge holders could come speak on topics um, that were addressed in the reading room exercise. So this is when I got involved in the project and Elisa C. De Jesus, who was a former English grad student and an RA at the Public Humanities Hub actually reached out to me to bring me on board and help with the event series um, in partnership with the HBS executive director, Bill Ewan. And Elisa and I had worked together on a number of projects before. We'd had a great working relationships as, um, as collaborators and co-conspirators. And the first topic that we decided to cover was this proposed redevelopment of the Joyce Street block near Joyce Collingwood Skytrain station. So this also happens to be um, the site of several Filipino-owned businesses and restaurants, um, or what Christopher Chung from the Thai E actually called Vancouver's Filipino heart. Um, so this is actually a picture of Bennett Miambanganata, who owns uh, Plato, which is a, a restaurant that's there. Um, so we hosted this reading room, this listening room, and then also a follow-up panel discussion on this topic for Heritage Vancouver Shaping Vancouver series. And in the listening room, we got to hear from the owner of Plato, who you see pictured here, um, who uh, basically talked about her experience of what it's like to be a business owner in this neighborhood. Um, we talked to her and then also a member of a uh, of Slice Mango Collective, which is a new youth-run Filipinx art and um, community collective who started the what was called the Slice of Support campaign, and that was to help save these businesses. So in these discussions, we got to hear from them about how much this food hub means to their community, how much these businesses support new migrants, how they help connect families who are spread between Canada and the Philippines, how they provide affordable food to local workers, how they're able to sustain other Filipinos, and ultimately how they provide a community gathering place to support these very important social and cultural connections. And the talks were recorded. So what you're looking at here are screenshots of the YouTube videos. Those are linked if you click on them. So you can feel free to check those out at a later time. Oops, that was not what I wanted to do. <laughs> all right. So at the same time that we were having all of these ongoing discussions, there was a, a call from Heritage BC that came out that was called their Time Memorial Grant that would allow up to $50,000 for a project. Um, and after several meetings between Heritage Vancouver, the Public Humanities Hub, the Asian Canadian and Asian Migration Studies Program, and Slice Mango, we decided we were going to apply for a storytelling project that would capture the oral histories of intergenerational Filipino Canadians, and that turned into Kuentong Pamamahe. Um, we are currently in the process of going through the ethics review at UBC, and we'll begin recording those stories in January. So the second, the second uh, thing that I want to talk to you about today is um, HBS and MOV. I'm going to go through this really quickly too. So this is uh, the last project to showcase here. It's between Heritage Vancouver Society, 
the Hub and Museum of Vancouver. It is called Making Space, and it's modeled on the Reading and Listening Room series. So the idea here is to work within the museum ex exhibition context, so it's another kind of heritage space, um, and it's to activate current exhibits at the MOV in larger discussion about heritage equity and social justice. So the the name Making Space actually speaks to three different project goals, one of which is to take up physical museum space. It's usually full of cultural objects and quote unquote artifacts um, to make space for a more grassroots approach for um, platforming community voices that are leading issues reflected in these exhibitions. And then third, to make space for new conceptions and definitions of what we mean when we talk about heritage and culture. So our first event was actually just on Saturday. It was just two days ago. Um, in tandem with a seat at the table, which is currently on view. Um, and that's a um, exhibit that looks at the Chinese migration history uh, and their descendants in British Columbia. So attendees were given a full day's admission to the museum to see the exhibit before or after the event. We hosted a screening of the short film Under Fire and a moderated panel discussion on the proposed Cantonese barbecue meat ban in Vancouver in the 60s and 70s. And we did this with the filmmakers, Christy Fong and Denise Fong, and then also anthropologist Imogene Lim. So Denise and Imogene also had curatorial and advisory roles in a seat at the table. There was a lunch that was provided. It was lunch and learn style. This came from a, um, uh, a Chinatown restaurant called Daisy Garden Kitchen, which has been there since 1979. Um, and we felt it was necessary for attendees to eat the food while discussing the film because it created this kind of participatory sensory experience. So when the barbecue masters in the film were discussing the precision of getting the right crunch, uh, you could actually hear the crunch happening in your own mouth and in your neighbor's mouth. So um, it was really interesting. And it also just drove home the idea that these intangible food ways and practices really have to be experienced to be fully appreciated. Um, and that they are in fact experiential in nature, which is part of the reason that um, they're so hard to capture or record. So we had lots of good coverage also by CBC. I've included a couple different segments um, from radio and from news in my uh, last slide, if, you look, if you'd like to check it out later on. Um, that is a very brief overview of the work that we're doing. I'm looking forward to discussing this more in the Q&A. Um, thank you. And I will hand it off to Kyle now. Hi, can everyone hear me okay? Thumbs up? Mm -hmm. Great. We were having um, problems with the microphone earlier, so I'll be brief. Anyway, welcome. Um, my name is Kyle Nelson. I work at the Center for Community Engaged Learning. I've been working at the intersection of pedagogy and community engagement for about 10 years now. Um, what I'm going to do is just briefly introduce the Center uh, and then get right into some relevant examples on uh, how we support uh, this work and how we support uh, building of not only individual, but <clears throat> hopefully group uh, and then uh, capacity as well as system capacity. Um, so we have a range of on uh, programs and activities, both curricular and co-curricular. Um, most of it of interest to this group is, is uh, in the educational stream are the programming and pathways uh, to support students with hands on opportunities to make a positive impact in, in our local communities. Um, so we really see uh, our role um, is, is building students up, um, building faculty up, building that capacity to engage not only efficiently, but ethically uh, in and with communities. I guess it also stems from this belief that um, we operate in the space where complex social problems that we're facing, uh, these complex conversations that you're hearing uh, elements about in these, in these projects, they require not only diverse perspectives, uh, but people working together, meaning people aren't gonna solve these uh, issues or address these issues or challenge, um, I guess, the, the structures in place uh, that surround these issues uh, by working alone or in, in, in solitude. And we heard a uh, great job, Sydney, talking about those uh, principles of community engaged learning. So I won't, I won't repeat that. Um, but I think you did a, an amazing job of highlighting uh, some of the sort of foundational uh, spaces that we promote uh, this work from, both both in terms of the educators and and the students. Um, what I'd like to jump into first is if we imagine <clears throat> you're an educator, how does the office support that individual capacity building? 
Um, so if you're planning a program or a course, we start with that uh, curricular integration piece. So really working alongside you in that one-to-one -one sort of consultation capacity uh, to help you select the best approach and framework. We heard a bunch of different models, especially in that, that sort of educative stream about how to go about and engage uh, ethically and effectively with community for, for different outcomes. Um, we do offer supports, guidance and resources as it comes to both partnership development uh, as well as project development. So um, thinking through the appropriate scope, what's the appropriate level for a first year course to engage in and with community uh, all the way up to say sort of more of a capstone experience, knowing that students disciplinary abilities will be uh, very different. Also thinking from a student developmental model framework, um, you know, their mental and emotional capacities are quite different in those moments too. They're thinking in different ways. Uh, you've seen it in, I'm, I'm sure, history and English. A first year English or history student um, thinks differently in, in different sort of, their relationship with, uh, with knowledge is quite different in their first and second year than it is in their third and fourth year. So that all fits into how we work with you to think about projects, what's appropriate uh, and what can be effective. Um, we also support through uh, course delivery. So, and I'll talk about that in some of those uh, examples, but everything from uh, conceptualization to the assessment and evaluation at the end. So what I'm gonna do is just highlight briefly uh, some, of the, some of the ways we build that or look to build the individual capacity for faculty. Um, and I'll touch on briefly, I think I did on that one-to-one that -one work uh, resources and tools, uh, a big part of our work. We also offer student facing workshops, um, cohort based professional development, uh, as well as funding, which uh, Ben alluded to and Maria alluded to in the beginning. Um, in terms of resources and tools, what you can expect uh, to support our journey from uh, conceiving or, or building uh, an idea to, you know, sort of assessing student learning and evaluating, let's say, the effectiveness of a partnership. Um, one of the things we're doing, we're in the middle of a, a website a relocation, um, but we're very close to publishing an open access Canvas catalog. And this will be something that everyone at UBC and beyond uh, can sign up for. Um, and it'll just be a, a whole host of curricular tools um, that'll be supportive in each part, uh, in each phase of the build out. I also wanted to share that we've uh, recently pil piloted uh, sort of a, a choose your own adventure or a menu of uh, engaging active learning activities in a few courses, uh, essentially to complement how you're bringing students, how you're preparing students to enter into and work with community. So um, working across five themes, you can essentially uh, grab lesson plans, grab activities, um, you know, if it's working across difference, if it's uh, looking at strengths or assets in the community. There's different ways to go about supporting um, sort of the meta themes of your course and those learning outcomes with some smaller activities. And what I'll do is I'll share um, a link. I, I just published uh, the, the slides to, um, to a Google, uh, Google Drive. And, and what I'll do is I'll share that at the end so you can kind of jump in there and click the links because all those links I think will be relevant. I mentioned, uh, you know, preparing faculty. So there's a lot of work um, in having conversations with individual faculty members, uh, meeting them where they're at, what are their career goals? What do they want to get out of the uh, community engaged learning experience for their students, for themselves? Um, so as much as, you know, faculty need that preparedness, students do too. Um, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, Sydney talked about um, some of those uh, complex social dynamics that students are entering into uh, potentially with some of these um, community engaged projects. Um, so we, here's an example of three of our workshops. Uh, one's fo focused on asset based community development. Um, so it takes that intentionally taking a lens uh, of strengths or strengths based approaches. And I think that responds in partial way to uh, Eve, like what Sydney said about Eve's Tuck, Eve Tuck's um, uh, paper uh, or article on um, you know moving towards that desire based framework I think there's probably some alignment there I think I'm going to dive into that article because it sounds very interesting. 
Um, we also talk a lot about uh, in one of our workshops, the ethics of change making and the starting point of that is really about power and positionality, having students explore uh, identities of self and other uh, in recognition that um, intersections of identity uh, and being a UBC student um, is a really important uh, self discovery journey to do first before you enter into and work with um, uh, other people in, in and with the community. As, alongside teammates in the classroom as well. Uh, and we also have a, another workshop that sort of gets to the different part of it, but it's more about the storytelling aspect. And this is storytelling for change workshop um, to think about specific techniques to uh, um, to answer those internal calls of curiosity to how do you tell the story, whether it's research, whether it's creating an infographic, uh, but using those intentionally to um address these power structures and use social change as a as a as a motivator we talked briefly about some of the funds so uh, there's currently a call out um, for some funding uh, looking to support you to build out um improve evaluate the resources systems and the structures that enable you to do the work do the community engaged learning courses and programs and initiatives our goal, again, with capacity building at the individual level, is that you have the tools and resources, you have the, you know, the coaching, the support, uh, whatever those things are um, to do the work, because we know it is um, an added, uh, an added risk um, and an added work for both uh, faculty and students, but also our community partners. Um, so we talked primarily like a real um, sort of quick scan of the individual capacity building examples. We also work to build group or systems capacity. So I mentioned those prof professional development workshops uh, where we have an intake uh, already for uh, new faculty looking to make this a part of their work. We've also developed um, uh, specific workshops for various departments. Uh, and or faculties who are looking to um, strategize ways to scaffold community engaged learning as a pedagogical strategy uh, across their department. Um, participation in a smaller uh, advancing community engaged learning fund may lead us to co, uh, co apply for a potential TLEF if you're looking for a course enhancement or program renewal. Part of our work, and I shared this earlier on in, uh, in response to Ben's note about you know, what are those supporting structures? Um, where, where, are the, where are those funding? Where's that resources? Where's that acknowledgement um, of this work? Um, we were a part of a, uh, a joint effort to really highlight and delve deeper on what's the UBC experience when teaching, um, you know, experiential education, community engaged learning as a part of that. Uh, in that report, uh, what you'll find is uh, some calls for the institution to really step up and in terms of providing the necessary uh, supports, recognition, uh, rewards. Um, the strategic plan is asking for this uh, type of work. Students are asking for this type of work. Employers, uh, whether it's in the private or nonprofit sectors, they're asking uh, for students to have these experiences and have the outcomes associated or that can be associated with those experiences. Uh, but the gap in the middle um, and then in the question uh, that the institution is asking itself and many faculties and departments are asking themselves um, are where are those structures or supports uh, in between to enable this. And in fact, that's uh, part of some of our work uh, ongoing right now is working a couple examples. One in uh, Maria Carbonetti's uh, Department of French, Hispanic and Italian Studies. They're asking that question openly about how do we support this work, knowing that it's a, a part of our strategic way forward. Um, we're also working with um, School of Community and Regional Planning and Geography. They're creating a joint um, urban studies uh, planning major, and they want to intentionally scaffold experiential and community engaged learning across this new uh, major pathway. And so we're asking the right questions, but there's still an acknowledged gap between um, you know, the institutional or the departmental strategic plans and how we actually go about and enliven it, um, knowing that, um, yeah, it does need support and it does deserve that recognition. Um, one example of a, of a collaboration where we've sort of gotten to that point is the Faculty of Land and Food Systems who have a shared curriculum across their multiple disciplinary perspectives. 
and it's been over um, well 10 years that I've been working uh, with them on and off to get from a point of um, you know there's always a constant retooling of pedagogical approaches and scaling of projects uh, but getting to the point where we're asking those questions about how to best support and resource this work in an ongoing way. Um, so acknowledgement from you know 10, 12, 15 years ago that there needed to be extra supports. So we're just sort of getting to that answering of that question now where they have a full time staff uh, coordinator role, uh, professional level uh, staff person uh, working full time on in terms of supporting some of the learning elements and in terms of supporting um, you know the the community engaged uh, coordination and administration and, and partnership building. So I'm going to end there knowing that the most exciting part of these talks um, is actually the Q&A and the dialogue that happens after. Thank you, Kyle. I just want to add uh, from the perspective of the hub, there are, are uh, funding sources that you can apply for if you go to the Public Humanities Hub website and look under um, programs, you'll see a number of different awards that we offer to people who do community engaged projects um, and also prizes for people who do community engagement work. Um, and also I wanted to draw your attention to uh, resources. We have a number of toolkits that help people learn how to produce the deliverables, some of which Ben was talking about, podcasts, Wikipedia entries, exhibits. So if any of those genres of public scholarship interest you and you want to give your students a quick introduction, these videotaped um, presentations on our YouTube channel and then the toolkits that accompany them are, are a good way in. Um, and I see in the chat that Kyle's telling us that also the Office of Community Engagement has funds available in a, in a number of capacities. So I want to open it up to discussion because I know that we're a bit short on time, but I feel like everyone who's presented has given some great insights. Um, the, this, this event is videotaped and will appear on our website and YouTube channel so people can consult it afterwards as well. So can I open it up for discussion? I'm able to see people. So if you want to raise your physical hand or, or raise a, a virtual hand, <laughs> we welcome your questions. Everyone's quiet. All right, I'm seeing some new messages, but well, I can get, Ben, yeah. I can get us started if no one else wants to, from, particularly from the public. But, uh, but I do have a question for Sydney. So this question of, I mean, so the answer to my question might be, it's I'm not asking about that part in that your star in the middle where they all intersect, but you brought up the question of ethics and then Kyle brought it up as well. Um, and so here's a here's a scenario for you. And so maybe the answer is, well, it's just a different kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, I kind of am an expert. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to play the devil's advocate here, but let me give you an example. So unrelated to what I've talked about, although what I'm going to, my, my example actually could be applied to the roadie house as well. The, I'm doing this other uh, virtual museum in collaboration with a public institution in Argentina. And it's about the past. And maybe again, history is different because um, you know, the community you're engaging is, is the public society rather than sort of, in this case, an ethnic community of the past. But I have a, a phase for stage two of my project right now. There's various things about immigrant narratives and, and things like that. And we're being supported by a public institution or supported by the institution, which is funded by public university. So they're just sort of like supporting actors, but they're going to promote us and things like that. Well, for phase two, I was thinking of having a exhibit on um, indigenous peoples and immigration and have indigenous voices about immigration and sort of the takeaway is Argentina is a settler state and we need to think more about marginalizing indigenous people when we talk about our grandparents narratives that is a good point however for my community partner in this case the Argentine government or uh, uh, the Argentine academic community or whatever maybe that's not what they want that I, I, I'm not being ethically safe I'm I'm declaring war on their national narrative. Um, and and so, so maybe the answer is, well, then you're just doing public engagement rather than community engagement. But what I'm trying to say is I'm willing to destroy my relationship at, at that moment when I make that relationship go live 
But you could do the same thing with the roadie house. If I wrote a, a bunch of blogs about how German they were and they don't like being called German because they're Victorian, waspy Vancouver. Uh, anyway, so I'm just trying to say the thing this we need to be ethical and we need to engage and be respectful for our, our community partners. I'm wondering what would you make of my desire to cause conflict? I can I can go first. Um, what I was actually thinking is not necessarily that it it's a question of like where that star fits in the Venn diagram, but more about is that the right community partner to be doing that work with? Um, so if if it's a relationship that you that you value and want to do some kind of project with, you might just have to find another project where you align better. But I'm sure there are other groups that would be totally down to burn down that nationalist narrative, and maybe that's the the community that you work with on that project. That's my that's my that's my initial thinking. <laughs> I just want to add, uh, just speaking to that point. Um, so when we work with students and community partners, um, so much preparation needs to happen for students to do this work well and ethically. Or, or if we have a large class, there's an ethical dilemma there. Like, great, I have 140 students I want to engage community with. While that can be a benefit, it could also be a harm, an un unintended harm. So. In instances like that, um, say we partnered with like the city of Vancouver for a large undergraduate course where they, you know, they work through some things, but the partner's a bit safe, right? Like it's a, it's a kind of a powerful institution. Uh, some students were critiquing it's a colonial institution. So how, like when we welcome students into that space, we have to address those things. We have to acknowledge those things um, and bring students in. Like there's two conversations. One, okay, students, you can contribute like your individual values or the values that you see not represented and, and sort of challenge a bit of the, what we're being presented to uh, by the city. Um, I'll just say there's wonderful people working at the city too uh, in social change. Um, but then the other aspect is we, we kind of know we can't do harm to the city based on this relationship. It gets a bit riskier as you get into like third and fourth year engagements that are maybe more or, or deeper and, and semester long. But there's still a lot of like ethical consideration um so it has to be led by the faculty member it has to be supported it has to be really open um and given students safe ish places to to fail and succeed um but there's some we definitely have different approaches based on the year level and and the support that can be given in class but who your partner is because it can be anyone really um yeah there's always that there's a there's always going to be attention and and being open and exploring that's kind of wonderful too so maybe there's a chance in your project to say see if they'd be open to dialogue or different voices it could be worth exploring rather than just setting it off fire uh, right away <laughs> i mean sometimes older institutions have drafted strategic plans that have real ambitions to change over time and it's still got to proceed in the way that they can handle as an institution, but you may be offering them something that would enable them to meet one of their objectives more, more easily than, they, than, they're, than they have capacity to do so on their own. Um, Maria. Yes, um, I'm thinking that uh, always this kind of work implies a huge risk and more, more now than ever, because this, the student's input is really, really strong. And then uh, it implies that we need to really reflect on our own principles and stick to it. And even if, if you need to go to cause conflict or, or, to, or to, um, to create some turmoil with your partner, I think it's worth it. And if the partner, well, the, the, there's the, the, the moment of, of thinking, okay, this is convenient to keep this partnership because it's great and it fits perfectly with, uh, with the course, with my academic career, with everything. Or I will try to look other ways to, or other partners or other ways to, to, um, to be true to, to what the students are are needing or or and, and my own um, my own values um, and now I'm I'm working with the, uh, indigenous um, literature and all that. Well, I think my work with uh, Chile with Universidad de la Frontera is done because now they want things I don't want to, and I I need to look for the second part of the project, and I'm trying to cross to Argentina, which will be <laughs> probably even more difficult than with Chile. Then you know that. 
<laughs> uh, but I think it's worth it. it the, we always work trying to uh, to be at ease with the risk in this. Um, it's not for, <laughs> we need to be strong uh, um, and courageous and the students also too. And they teach us a lot about being courageous these days, I think. Yeah, I just want to add a little anecdote um, because it's one of my favorite things about how the partnership developed with Slice Mango Collective is the second that they got an email from Heritage Vancouver, all of their alarm bells went off and they were just like, oh my God, the institutions have arrived. What do they want from us? Why are they here? Um, and they were pretty reluctant to meet with us at first because they saw UBC and then they saw Heritage Vancouver Society and were like, we can't possibly imagine what these people want from us. Um, but we had conversations with them and the whole time we were filling out this grant application for the 150 time immemorial grant, we were just raging about how colonial the structure of the grant was and all the ways that it made you try and um, explain and justify why the work was valuable when it was supposed to be 100% for marginalized communities. Um, but they made you justify this in the grant. And so the whole time in the back end, we were having these conversations, but it was like, okay, we're going to get into the institutional side of it and we will get the money and then we will do good work with it and try and break things from the inside. And so we we kind of became co-conspirators and used the opportunity to, to talk about, like we acknowledge these positions of power that we're all holding in these positions, but we think we can do good work together and let's give it a go. So that's how that whole relationship started. <laughs> Great. I was thinking about Ben's point that, you know, he's a historian and he wants to do this. It's possible that if some of the, like if the mic is passed to some of your students, particularly those that might come from indigenous perspectives or, you know, make room for those students, then the institution might be forced to listen to some voices that they don't, they, all, they haven't already decided they're in conflict with like you the prof you know they would just be hearing from a broader group of young people who who might be pushing the institution in a in a less authoritative way uh, authoritative way but a maybe a more moving way uh cat hi thanks I uh, realize we're really short on time. I'm Kat from the Community Engagement Office. Thanks everyone for the presentations. Um, I just wanted to really quickly just um, raise partner recognition. Um, if we have more time, I'd love to hear your thoughts on recognizing partners for the contributions. Um, and then just to, to mention um, our office, Community Engagement, we've started a conversation around um, how UBC recognizes partners. There's no guidelines. Um, something like the Indigenous Financial Guidelines. We don't have anything um, for non-Indigenous partners. And something that came up at the session we just hosted was around community-engaged learning. So I don't know, Kyle, maybe I'll follow up with you. I know your office has certainly done um, work on partner recognition, but there seems to be interest in having conversation on how, um, how faculty are, are recognizing their community partners who are educating students in the classroom and, and with community-engaged learning courses and projects. That's a great point, Kat. Our cluster funding that involves um, academics, but also people in the community, groups in the community, can move some of the funds to partners. So there's a lot of latitude that the PI would have to acknowledge the work that's coming from a number of parties in the, in the cluster. Um, we are right at time. So I completely appreciate that people have to go and have lives, but I wanna thank everyone for these great presentations. We'll share the link with you when it's ready and we encourage you to um, contact us if you need any, any help, if you wanna collaborate, if you want the links again and thank you for coming. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>